So our next speaker is uh, Hami Tamzei, who already explained to you the LFQ on Monday, but today he will talk about metabolomics. Hello and good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Pavel, for the nice talk. Following on Pavel's talk, I will be talking about uh, max quant for metabolomics. And I'd like to just start off with uh, a brief history of metabolomics. Uh, the term metabolome was first uh, introduced in 1998 uh, by uh, Oliver, who measured the relative concentrations of metabolites in yeast after gene deletion or overexpression. And uh, quite soon after that, uh, we had the term metabolomics come about by Fien, which is just about three years. And this is quite uh, interesting because, for example, the genetics uh, community took about 70 years to go from studying single genes to the entire set of genomes, an entire set of genes uh, which they coined as genomics. Uh, this just shows that we are, in, we are living in a very exciting era with advancement in technology allowing us to analyze these uh, entire sets of biomolecules, and it's quite nice to be living in this era. Uh, and then we have lipidomics, which came a few years after that, which is just the subdivision of metabolomics, studying the entire set of uh, lipids. Uh, and just to give you an overview, we have the genome, which uh, consists of DNA. We have four bases that we try to identify, and it's just a sequence and maybe some structural variants that you're interested in. Uh, then we have the transcriptome with RNA, again, four bases. We have the protome with 20 amino acids and modifications, of course. And we have the metabolome. But here, we really have thousands and hundreds of thousands of compounds that we deal with. But the most uh, exciting thing about metabolomics is that it is the closest level of uh, data that we can get to the phenotype. So this makes it very, very interesting and very exciting for us. Now, there are several different analytical platforms for metabolomics, uh, you, and they range from uh, NMR to LCMS. And with NMR, you're very good in uh, trying to identify and detect known metabolites. Um, and with LCMS, you have the chance to uh, even identify metabolites that are novel and not yet unknown. Uh, so at the uh, lower end, we have uh, lower uh, sensitivity and detection limit, and as we go up uh, this graph, then we get higher sensitivity in the instruments. There are two types of uh, metabolomics you can do. There is, un there is targeted and non-targeted. In targeted, you, uh, similar to protomics, you're interested in a specific set of metabolites, and that's what you try to detect. And in un untargeted, we really want to, again, similar to protomics, get the entire picture. Now, there are several lessons to be learned from protomics in LCMS, and we will, uh, what we are trying to do is we are trying to transfer our expertise from protomics to metabolomics. And as you've been uh, hearing in many talks that we've had, protomics is quite successful now. Uh, and it's quite reproducible and robust, and we have nice computational algorithms and programs that help us do, uh, for example, label-free protomics. Um, uh, but on the other side, we don't really have... Uh, we, we haven't progressed so much on the metabolomics side. Uh, and. On, on our side, this is because there's a lack of high performance and fully automated uh, data analysis workflows, and that's what we're aiming to do here. So just to remind you of the main, um, main steps in protomics, uh, we have the feature detection, mass recalibration, retention time alignment, match between runs, and processing of MSMS, and we, will, we can just basically take some of these steps and reuse them in the metabolomics, uh, workflow, and then we also will uh, add some steps that uh, should be uh, specific for metabolomics. So, for example, feature, feature detection and retention time alignment. And I will go into more detail in the next few slides. So, uh, what are our main strategies for metabolomics? 
the main strategy will be having a, uh, constructing a library of plausible MZ values. These values will be the masses of uh, compounds that we uh, expect to see in a, a biological sample. So this is not uh, a library of all the masses that are theoretically possible, but masses for compounds that will most probably be in our samples. And first, uh, our first aim is to uh, really focus on the Orbitrap mass spectrometer because of the high mass accuracies that it gives us, especially in the lower mass ranges. Uh, and this is important because most of the compounds that we are trying to target here and trying to identify here are probably lower than 1,000 or even 500 uh, Daltons. Um, this uh, figure here shows the similarities and also the differences between the proteomics and metabolomics uh, uh, workflows. So uh, the green uh, boxes are what are shared between uh, the two workflows and the orange or yellow boxes are uh, what will be different between them. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, explain a little bit more how this uh, library is constructed and how we use it to uh, identify our uh, compounds. Uh, so the library uh, is built, uh, again, to emphasize plausible, uh, around plausible MZ values. And what we do is we take uh, publicly available data uh, from different databases and we try to find uh, features uh, and then add these features into our library. So our library is just a basically a, a list of uh, compounds and their masses and also maybe their adducts and basically every single kind of feature that you can see in these, uh, in these data, set, data sets. Uh, and uh, again, to emphasize, these are not monoisotopic masses, but all the isotopic peaks. Uh, and then what happens is that uh, every single new run that we want to detect compounds in will be aligned to this library with a nice fit. Uh, so then we can, we can say a compound A is in our run or not, or compound B is in our run or not. Um, yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm just now moving to uh, explain a little bit more how the library is built. So we currently have about 71 data sets uh, and uh, more than 1,500 runs. Uh, and then we do the feature detection on them. And um, prior to, uh, some of the library was, made, uh, was handmade, so hand curated. Uh, and then the rest is automatically generated by the algorithm. With each iteration of runs that we do internally, we make the library grow in size, and then we will make the library available for users to use. Uh, and basically, after we hand curate a, a specific set of uh, compounds in the library, we just iteratively run uh, many different runs. And actually, um, I think we are now in the range of uh, about 6,000 runs that we've run through, and the library is growing slowly. And uh, after we find the common peaks between many different uh, publicly available data, and if the compound reoccurs in um, different samples, then we add it back to the library again. So there's this kind of uh, iterative uh, adding to the library. So uh, the, what happens is after we have the library, we uh, we utilize what we call a morphing algorithm, uh, which I will explain in more detail a few slides from now. But the main thing is that we pay special attention to the smoothness of the fit, so we're not uh, overfitting, so we're not identifying things that are not there, for example. Um, and then since we are not trying to, uh, since we do this, uh, we save a lot of computational time and we're also able to uh, do the identification at the MS1 level and, and not have to uh, uh, rely on MSMS spectra, which are much more complex in uh, metabolomics, since unlike proteomics, the 
there are many different kinds of bonds that can break in MSMS, and, and identifying them is very hard, and then we can't have this um, certain database search uh, kind of happening there. So this is how the library mapping works. So here on the top, we have the masses from Iran that we have detected. And in the bottom, we have the masses within the library. So you see the library, each, each uh, little uh, black line here is an entry in the library. Uh, and each black uh, uh, line here is a, a feature that we have detected within the run. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the delta mass, so the difference between this feature and this feature. And what happens is uh, we try to fit as many as these little lines that we have here, the masses within a run, to, ma to the masses in the library. And then we do uh, a recalibration to make these differences as small as possible. So we try to uh, bring these masses closer to, uh, together. And the closer they are, the more confident we are in them. And that's how we do the MS1 identification. Now, there are... Uh, software already ready in readily available uh, out there, and they have uh, they pretty much utilize the same kind of uh, uh, workflow for metabolomics. Uh, you can see that they have some kind of filtering, some feature detection, uh, some normalization, alignment, and uh, as, and such. But we uh, we had um, a very uh, bright uh, bachelor student in our uh, group last year, and she actually compared all these algorithms together. And unlike uh, uh, Rudy Abelsot's uh, talk, we <laughs> we found that they are not very uh, comparable to each other. So you see that there is a really a, a high difference, a, a really big number of differences between the features that they have uh, they they could find. Uh, and this just goes to show that there is a lot to improve. And even though they use the same kind of ideas, um, that they find really different results. But what Max Quant uh, will be uh, different from these is that it will have this library alignment thing, uh, this mass morph thing, and then we will really try to benchmark it similar to like the LFQ algorithm that uh, I talked about before. So this is just an overview of the steps that uh, MaxCon for Metabolomics will have. And uh, we are slowly uh, working to implement every single step. Uh, as you can see, some of them come directly from proteomics, and some will be uh, tailor-made for the metabolomics uh, workflow. So I'm just going to go to some uh, preliminary results. So the most important thing was the library and mass morphing. Uh, and here I have some results for that. So this is uh, the, the histogram on top, is uh, the histogram of the full, uh, the, uh, full weight fat half maximum of the uncalibrated versus calibrated delta PPMs of the uh, mass uh, morphing. And uh, below here, I can, uh, I'm showing you the, the calibrated one. And as you can see, we can nicely shift um, the differences uh, to the left and lower this difference, which is very important uh, for, to be able to um, get good identifications. And uh, on the range of 1 ppm, when you're on the range of 1 ppm, that's basically an hyd a hydrogen. Uh, and then if you can detect that, then, then you're pretty much sure that you have everything uh, identified. Now, the library size grows with each, uh, uh, each iteration. So this is the first data set that we used from a collaborator. Uh, and, and, and as you can see, uh, the x-axis here shows the number of iterations that I've done. I've, uh, I've run the software several times on the same data set. And as I showed you, it's like this iterative adding of masses. So we, we grow the library in size as every time we run the same data set again. Uh, so it grows uh, with every iteration, and this happens in uh, all the uh, runs that we have, about 70. Uh, these are public. Uh, these ones are from uh, public databases. And so the library grows, but then it, uh, it kind of saturates at uh, some stage. For some samples, it does this uh, quicker than others. Um, and then we go to 
the number of identified features. Now, this is the first data set that was used, again, just to remind you, for the hand-curated uh, li library. And because the library grew significantly after the second iteration with all the other public data, you see that the number of identified features is growing quite rapidly in the first one, and then it becomes uh, flat again. But for all the other data sets, this becomes uh, less since uh, the, the library becomes more um, somehow accurate. And then we have the number of identified features again saturating here. Uh, and also, this, the same thing happens for the number of matches between runs. As the library becomes more robust, the number of match between runs also uh, reduces and then becomes flat. So that's the basic idea between, uh, for uh, MaxCon for Metabolomics. And uh, I hope we have a working version uh, soon or so that you guys can try it out and give us your feedback. And with that, uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Jürgen again and the entire team. It's very nice to work with them, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you. So thank you, Hamid. Um, questions? Yes. Hi, Hamid. Thank Hi. you for this nice talk. Um, I would like to ask what kind of samples are uh, these, uh, uh, that you use from these 70 data, data sets? It can be any sample. So the biological experiments, they are from many different organisms, mice, human, uh, cell lines, uh, rat, anything really. So we want to make the library as comprehensive as possible. Great. Uh, and the second question, uh, how do you do actually this recalibration based on what criteria? So the recalibration is basically trying to uh, bring cl together as close as possible the masses in the library to the masses in the run. So it's kind of, um, it's, there's a special algorithm. We start with large windows and then we slowly uh, make the windows uh, narrower to get this mass morphing algorithm to work, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank Hi. you, thank you for the talk. Um, will you be benchmarking it against the Compound Discoverer software, which I, I believe has um, MSMS libraries as well as part of that yes. functionality? So we will be actually uh, providing an API for MSMS libraries. So that, uh, that will be there too, uh, but the first version will be uh, solely on the MS1, uh, MS1. Uh, but yes, we would like to uh, benchmark it. And uh, we already compared all the other software together and then, but the main benchmarking that I would like to do is actually have like some, some kind of standard sample and then to know if I'm being uh, accurate enough. But Jürgen has some more comments on that. Actually, not on this, but to something previous. I mean, just so that we don't um, add some confusion here. So what we call identifications in this context here. So this is more like uh, preliminary identifications for the purpose of doing this mass recalibration and alignment and so on. Right. So it's really crucial that later there will also be the MSMS library API for the actual identification of, uh, of the compounds, right? And distinguishing isomers and all these kind of things. So we're not claiming that we can do all these things just with the MS1 features, but we can do a lot with the MS1 features, like nail down elemental compositions for many more compounds than was possible before. And uh, so that's why we speak about identification. So it's not the kind of ident identification that is completely comprehensive uh, that would distinguish isomers and things like this, right? Okay, if there are no more questions, we can thank Hamid again for his nice talk. Thank you.